In the Bay of Bengal, the archipelago of Andaman and Nicobar Islands spreads along 780 kilometers of ocean. The total geographical area is about 8,293 square kilometers. Once the dreaded destination of the freedom fighters, a penal settlement is now a destination rediscovered. For those who want freedom from pollution, freedom from the concrete jungle and the maddening crowd, Andaman is just the place. A tropical Shangri-La, verdant and lush, these islands are India's answer to the best of Hawaii. And what's more, they are untouched and pristine beyond imagination. A marvelous mix of nature's most precious delights, the Andaman and Nicobar Islands are once in a lifetime holiday experience. The call of the wild and the lure of the islands is backed by an efficient tourist support network that caters to every possible comfort. The capital town of these islands, Port Blair, is about 1,200 kilometers from both Chennai and Calcutta. Alliance Air operates four flights a week from Chennai and Calcutta. And Jet Airways has a flight scheduled every day to and from Chennai during tourist season. Ship services are available from Chennai and Calcutta approximately once a week. Begin your voyage of discovery from Port Blair, the gateway to paradise on earth, where nature's best kept secrets have been ecologically preserved. Port Blair has a number of exciting, informative places of historical significance, which are a must see on a tourist itinerary. Before you begin your excursion around South Andaman and other islands of tourist interest in the group, finish your city tour. There are a number of hotels and guest houses in the private and government sectors which offer accommodation to suit all budgets. The government accommodation includes the Andaman Teal House, the picturesque Hornbill Nest at Carbins Cove, the Dolphin Yatri Nivas at Havelock Island, just to name a few. There are also a number of restaurants with different cuisines to suit every taste. Vishranti is an exclusive seafood restaurant. It is advisable to visit the Andaman and Nicobar Tourism Office at Port Blair to plan a proper itinerary. The office provides you with a lot of literature, booklets and brochures with information on different tourist spots and also does bookings for accommodations in guest houses run by the tourist department at different islands. One can also buy souvenirs, t-shirts, etc. It is said that when you are at Port Blair, a visit to the cellular jail is a must. The penal settlement established here by the British after the First War of Independence in 1857 was the beginning of an agonizing story of the massive and awful Salila Jail. The construction started in 1896 and the jail was completed in 1906. It had seven wings radiating out from the central tower and housed 689 cells. Originally a penal settlement, the cellular jail epitomizes all the misery, the trials and tribulations faced by the Indian freedom fighters, many of whom were sent here to serve life sentences. Now, a national memorial, the cellular jail has a museum where exhibits depict prison life in the early 1900s. The saga of this heroic struggle is now brought alive in a moving Sonne Lumiere that is the sound and light show in the evenings. Aberdeen Bazaar, with a clock tower in the center, built in memory of those soldiers who died during the First World War, is the oldest and still the most popular bazaar and is located in the heart of Port Blair town. The fisheries museum called the Aquarium is situated near the Andaman Water Sports Complex. Here one can see the rare varieties of corals, about 350 species of sea life and enormous marine life peculiar to the islands 
and found in the Indo-Pacific and the Bay of Bengal. Samudrika is another marine museum established and run by the Indian Navy. It was set up to create an awareness on various aspects of oceanic environments and conservation of marine life. Here one can witness a wide variety of shells and marine life. Anthropological Museum at Port Blair is an ethnographic museum. It illustrates the four Negrito tribes of the Andamans, the Jarawas, the Sentinelese, the Great Andamanese, the Ongis, and the Mongolite tribes of the Nicobar, the Nicobaris, and the Shompans. The museum displays the tools, implements, arts, and handicrafts of the tribals. The photographic display depicts the respective culture backgrounds and records of exploratory expeditions undertaken. The Forest Museum offers an insight into forestry activities and sawmilling through miniature models. The rare species of ornamental woods and decorative pieces made of various types of timbers found in these islands such as padok, marble wood, satin wood etc. are also kept on display. The museum is set by the forest department. The mini zoo in Port Blair has some of the rarest species of endemic birds and animals found in these islands. One can see the crab-eating macaque, saltwater crocodile, white-bellied sea eagle, the Andaman dark serpent eagle, Andaman python, deer, wood pigeon and many more. For souvenirs and gifts, visit the Cottage Industries Emporium Sagarika which exhibits a spectrum of artifacts made of mother of pearl and other seashells and local wood products. Palm mats for floors, tables and furniture are also available here. Khadi Gramodyog Emporium next door basically displays Khadi textiles, wood crafts, shell crafts and rural handicrafts. If you want to spend a relaxing, peaceful evening or have a nature walk, then the Gandhi Park in the heart of Port Blair is just the right place. The enticing park comprises of amusement entertainment park, Japanese temples, bunkers, beautiful garden and water sports facilities in the lake inside. The Chatham Island is connected to the main island by a bridge and houses the Chatham Sawmill. The sawmill is one of the oldest and biggest in Asia. The mill still caters to the local needs of sawn timber for construction work and furniture. A seven kilometer drive from Aberdeen by the seashore road will take you to Corbin's Cove, which is one of the most picturesque sea beaches, ideal for sea bathing and sun basking. It provides a kaleidoscopic view of the blue waterfront. Next to the beach is an air-conditioned restaurant and a bar called The Waves, which is run by the tourism department. The complex also provides a change room and fresh water showers. There is also provision for horse riding. If you want to warm up before the excursion tours, a visit to the Andaman Water Sports Complex is a must. This unique complex, the first of its kind in India, has all possible aqua sports facilities including safe water sports and adventure sports. Enjoy the spectacular water scooter ride or the thrilling speedboat round. And if you are daring enough, try windsurfing or simply sit and enjoy the water skiing, parasailing, sailboats and more. The Andaman Water Sports Complex also provides scuba diving facilities. A ferry ride from Phoenix Bay Jetty provides a unique experience of a cruise along the harbour. The panoramic view of seven points around Port Blair from the sea is just breathtaking. This one-hour trip includes the trip to Viper Island which housed a prison before the cellular jail was constructed. The gallows for the condemned prisoners, situated atop a hillock, can be seen with a guardhouse below. Across the Andaman Water Sports Complex, a short 20 minutes boat ride from Phoenix Bay Jetty takes you to Ross Island. Once the seat of British power and capital of these islands, 
It stands now in ruin of the bygone days. Attractive signs and information boards take visitors to mysterious annals of history of the islands, which include the church, the bakery, the ballroom and chief commissioner's residence. Engulfed by huge ficus roofs forming exquisite designs over the walls and the roofs, one can see photographs and a good collection of old records in Smritika, a small museum maintained by the Navy. The island is now under the Indian Navy because of its strategic position. Now begin your excursion in South Andaman to explore nature's best kept secrets. About 29 kilometers from the capital is the Mahatma Gandhi Marine National Park, popularly called Wandu. The park is accessible by road from Port Blair. Wandur has a long stretch of beach with its lovely backdrops, Casuarina, coconuts groves and sea mahua. One can see nature's craftsmanship at its best. The park is a base to visit islands like Jolly Boy, Redskin for exotic marine life, rare colorful underwater corals and mangrove creeks. If you prefer beaches and reefs to ruins, then Jolly Boy in the Mahatma Gandhi Marine National Park is another destination for tourists. Jolly Boy has a regular organized trip from Wandu. A ferry ride to Jolly Boy takes an hour from Wandu. The journey is like a riverboat cruise, which offers a breathtaking underwater view of the magnificent coral colonies and marine life through the glass bottom boat. The island is covered with gleaming white sand. Fringing these marvelous beaches on one side are some of the cleanest waters under the sun. Shimmering turquoise and transparent as glass. Snorkeling and scuba diving beneath these waters are lifetime experiences for anyone. Redskin is another island in the Marine National Park that offers spectacular views of corals and marine life. If you want to be lonesome on your own some, then Redskin is just the place for you. Sink Island is 26 kilometers from Port Blair, declared as a sanctuary. This is an enchanting island. Here, the lure of underwater coral gardens and unspoiled beaches is irresistible. A superb place for swimming, scuba diving and snorkeling a fine sandy beach and tropical rainforest. The island is divided into North and South Sink, which are connected by a sandbar. Chartered boats of permitted category are allowed from Wandur and Chidiatapu. Chidiatapu, also known as Bird Island, at the southernmost tip of South Andaman, is a popular picnic spot with lush green mangroves and the beach. The forest guest house, situated on top of a hillock, provides a fabulous, breathtaking sunset view. If you want a break from the sea, sand and the marine life, take a trip to Mount Harriet. The summer headquarters of the Chief Commissioner during the British Raj, it is an ideal place for trekking. 365 meters high, it is the second highest peak in the Andamans. One can trek up to Madhuban through a nature trail and can find rare flora and fauna and endemic birds, animals and butterflies. On your way to Wandur, Mahatma Gandhi Marine National Park, one can stop by at the Sipi Ghat Farm, a research and development programs for cultivation of cloves, nutmeg, cinnamon, pepper and coconut are conducted. The farm is spread over an area of 80 acres. Only 32 kilometers away from Port Blair is a beautiful island with green forests and sandy beaches called Neil Island. It provides an ideal holiday for eco-friendly tourists. 
It is called the land of vegetables for the local market. Cycle and cycle rickshaws are the only transport for the tourist. One can stay in the guest house run by the tourism department called Havabil Nest. There are two good beaches. Lakshmanpur beach is about one and a half kilometers from the guest house, surrounded by thick tropical rainforest. And the Sitanagar beach is about five kilometers. This sandy beach is surrounded by limestone shore. Here you can see a nature's wonder, an impressive bridge-like natural rock formation. Havelock Island provides an idyllic resort in the lap of beautiful virgin beaches and unpolluted environment. Dolphin Yatri Nivas, run by the tourism department, provides a luxurious stay with spectacular turquoise blue water and golden sandy beach. If you have the spirit of adventure, you could camp at the Radhanagar beach, which is just a 10 kilometer ride from the Dolphin Yatri Nivas. The beach offers unadulterated enjoyment for those who love the sea, the sun and the sand. If you wish to be away from the hustle and bustle of tourists that come from all over the world, there is much more to explore. Proceed to North and Middle Andamans across Baratang along the Andaman Trunk Road that runs from Port Blair to Diglipur. The journey includes three ferries. The length of the road is approximately 290 kilometers. The outback is raw, untamed, where life is as it was a century ago or a thousand years ago. This is where the Aboriginal legends come to life. The route goes through dense forest and Jarawa tribal reserve. Security guards, police escort are provided by the bush police for all transport. Rangat is the biggest town in the middle Andaman. It is about 90 kilometers by sea from Port Blair and 170 kilometers by road. The journey takes about six hours by road from Port Blair. It provides an ideal holiday for eco-friendly tourists. For anyone who wishes to be one with nature, the ideal destination is the Kurt Best Bay, around 15 kilometers from Rangat. Accommodation here is available at the Hawksbill Nest, a perfect getaway for nature lovers. Overlooking the Kurt Best Bay Beach, which is also a turtle nesting ground. It is surrounded by a small, peaceful village of fishermen, where people live and work in the tranquility of nature. Just 10 kilometers from Rangat and 10 minutes walk from the main trunk road is the Arm Kunj beach, which offers privacy and isolation. This beach is ideal for tourists seeking the lap of the sun, the sea and fun. The mini Panchavati waterfalls on the way is just not to be missed. It's nature's model of a rockery. If you wish to gear up before you trek up the saddle peak in Diglipur, then try trekking up the Panchavati hill in the middle Andamans. Trek is beautiful with running streams from the hill enveloped by the dense rainforest where you are irresistibly drawn to the poetry and soul of the enchanting forest. Long Island offers a real enchanting sandy beach at Lalaji Bay, which is about 6 kilometers away by sea from the Long Island jetty and 11 kilometers by jungle trek. You can bargain with a local fisherman for small fishing boats at the jetty to take you there. One can also go there from Rangat jetty. The journey is of about two hours. The beach is surrounded by coconut plantations and a beautiful forest. For anybody who wants to be amidst nature without any kind of disturbances other than the sound of the waves and the song of the birds, this is just the place. Explore the Rangat drive to Mayabandar, which is a fascinating 72 kilometers journey. On the way, one can see the elephants lumbering activity along the roadside. 
It is an amazing sight to see the elephants lifting heavy logs with the help of their trunks and dumping them in trucks. Maya Bandar is a small port town which provides a most ideal holiday in an unpolluted environment and rare scenic beauty. It has a well-developed market where you can buy all your provisions. The Andaman and Nicobar tourism provides creature comforts at all its eco-tourism destinations in the Andamans. Set amidst the lush green tropical rainforest and beckoning hills, each resort is an oasis of peace with enchanting atmosphere. They offer luxury and privacy. The swift let nest at Karmatang in Maya Bandar is one of them. The Karmatang beach, a turtle nesting ground, is just a 10 minute walk from the guest house and about 17 kilometers by bus from Maya Bandar. One can also stay in the APWD guest house at Maya Bandar, built on a hilltop, which commands a panoramic view of the bay. For the sea friendly, the choice of beaches is staggering here. Rampur Beach is another beach on the way to Karmatang. This beach is surrounded by Kajurina groves. An ideal getaway, especially from the city crowd. Pokhadera Beach is where you can inhale the silence of the moment that brings peace to your soul and heart. While you are in Maya Bandar, a trip to Avis Island is a must. Reach this little island by boat from Maya Bandar Jetty. Untouched, secluded beaches with panoramic coconut groves and dramatic coastal scenery delight you here. Curlew is another island just 15 minutes by boat from Maya Bandar. The island is under the forest department. It has a cozy little beach and a beautiful forest area. Diglipur in North Andaman offers real enchanting beaches for miles, a rare experience of the sea, sun and sand for the eco-friendly tourist. There are two daily boat services for Maya Bandar via Kalighat. But those who are keen on having a closer look at the mangroves avenue can hire a boat from Maya Bandar. The journey through the meandering creeks has some of the most spectacular and majestic scenery. Tranquility of Turtle Resort at Kalipur. Nestling in the hills, this resort is one place where you can shrug off your worries, fill your lungs with pure fresh air and rejuvenate your soul. Awaken to a thousand birds singing. Watch green magic weave a spell for miles and enjoy the experience that goes beyond any other. The Kalipur beach in the lap of Saddle Peak is just a five minute walk from here. A well-developed cozy beach where you can swim or simply relax and get tanned and enjoy the tranquil scene. Kalipur Wilderness Resort leads to Saddle Peak at 732 meters, the highest point in the Andamans. After lazing on the beach, Head for a trek to Saddle Peak through the enchanting forest to mystery and excitement where you can race with the wind and see wonder in every tree in the awesome forest. There is a boat service from Port Blair twice a week to Aerial Bay Jetty in Diglipur. You can hire a boat from here and make a trip to Ross and Smith Island. The journey takes about an hour and a half. Permission for the visit can be obtained from the forest department on payment. On the way, you can stop at Little Ross. This island has a sandy beach like a sandbar on one side, which is a nesting ground for reef herons. And on the other side is a rocky beach overlooking the Ross and Smith Islands. Ross and Smith Islands offer sparkling azure waters and golden ivory beaches. An unbelievable mere 15 meters away on the other side of the sandy strip is a thick, dense rainforest 
with birds of paradise and exotic blooms within arm's reach. Let the sea transform you. Bring tranquility to your soul as waves of the blue sea bring beauty to its sun-kissed beaches. The islands are connected by a sandbar which gets separated during high tide. Kalpong, the only river in the Andaman group, originates from Saddle Peak and flows through Diglipur. Before packing up and leaving Diglipur, make a trip to Ramnagar Beach. It is about 16 kilometers from Kalighat and a trek of 15 minutes through the reserved forest path. This beach offers solitude. There is a long stretch of untouched beach where even the waves are introverts. The beach is surrounded by pandanus and the tropical rainforest. Another destination worth a visit is the Little Andaman, better known as Hut Bay. An eight hours journey by ship from Port Blair. Accommodation here is available at the PWD Guest House. You can visit the famous waterfalls of Little Andaman, which provide cool havens amidst the tropical rainforest. Visit the elephant training camp of the Forest Corporation and watch the elephants being trained to drag logs as a first lesson. About 14 kilometers away from the guest house is a beach maintained and protected by the Forest Corporation. The golden white beach, as clean and uncluttered as on the day this earth was created. No tins, no cans or plastic bags, no orange peels or oil slicks, just the call of the cockatoo and your footprints on the sand. Just watch the clouds drift by on the sand. A must visit here is a red oil palm plantation where you can see the red oil palm fruit being collected and transported to the factory. You can also visit the red oil palm factory where crude palm oil is extracted from the fruit which is a very interesting process. The Nicobari tribal settlement is only about 5 kilometers from Hut Bay where one can have a look at their lifestyle. The seashore along the coast is a great sight. One can see miles of reef formations fringing the marvelous sandy beach acting as a barrier against sea erosion. Ecotourism, the heartbeat of Andamans, pulsating with lifetime experiences, invites you. There is plenty to see and do. So, take a break from urban life, escape from the world to this paradise on earth that will touch your soul, set your heart aflutter where you can relax, soak up the tropical sunshine, experience peace on earth and take back memories that will last a lifetime.
floating in splendid isolation. East of Port Blair is Ross Island, the famous seat of British administration over the islands. It is a great saga of splendor, a bubbling township, all comforts of the garrison, including freshwater swimming pool and ice factory. Ross Island had its origin on the 10th of March, 1858, when Dr. J.P. Walker, the jail superintendent, arrived at Port Blair, then called Port Cornwallis, with four European officers, several convicts, an Indian overseer, with 50 brigades of men and two native doctors to raise the penal settlement. Ross Island was named after Marine Surveyor Sir Daniel Ross. On arrival here, Dr. Walker occupied Chatham Island and started clearing its jungle. But due to shortage of drinking water on the island, he transferred three gangs, each comprising of 25 convicts, to Ross Island at the mouth of the harbor. The convicts were the rebellious, deserters and seditionists of the Indian National Rising of 1857 known as a First War of Independence. The freedom fighters cleared the jungle and built barracks and other structures in Ross, after which they were moved to Viper Island, where the first jails were built. On the fourth day of their arrival, one convict, number 46, Narunjan Singh, committed suicide at a secluded spot of Ross Island. Unable to bear the punishment and torture, Many convicts escaped on a raft or by swimming from Ross to the main island, but they never made it. They were either killed by the tribals or died of hunger. Chatham Island housed the hospital and later the sawmill. Dr. J.P. Walker, the jail superintendent, wrote to C. Beedon, secretary to the government of India. Chatham Island, selected as a headquarters of the settlement, is inferior in position to Ross Island at the mouth of Port Blair, which completely commands the entrance, appears to be more healthily situated, is of more suitable size, and possesses a good supply of excellent drinking water. The government of India conceded to Walker's proposal to establish Ross Island as the headquarters of the penal settlement. So, Ross Island became the headquarters of this infancy penal settlement from the very first day of its occupation. Ross had been entirely cleared and construction work was completed by 1860 such as superintendent's house, clerk's houses, iron roofed godowns for the commissariat. Besides these was a hospital for naval brigades and Europeans of the settlement. Six wells were dug most of them yielded good drinking water. Besides this, a pond was also developed and maintained for the supply of water. To develop friendly relations with the Andamanese, Reverend Henry Corbyn developed friendship with the Aborigines during 1863 and formed an Andaman home. The Europeans established a private school under a chaplain of Ross for educating their children. The British, true to their race, at once set about laying a tennis court and a swimming pool. They secured and provided all the amenities and facilities in the Ross Island, like the bazaar, the bakery, the churches, clubs, and ballroom, public buildings, inclusive of Chief Commissioner's bungalow, Secretariat, printing press, supply and commissariat go-downs,
residential quarters, libraries, post office and infantry barracks. The powerhouse was established by using very large steam boilers specially fabricated in England. The building also housed the ice factory and mineral water plant. The seacoast wall was extended to an extent of 16,129 cubic feet during 1892-93. Gradually the settlement grew and expanded in a few years. The strength of the native infantry was increased to 300 soldiers under three British officers and the British Infantry Detachment was strengthened to 140 personnel. The British Infantry Barrack was located on the northern side of the island on a hill. In the year 1861, the administration of the settlement was transferred from the Government of India to the control of the Chief Commissioner of Burma, but was again reverted under the control of the Government of India in the year 1869. The settlement was under the superintendentship from 1858 to 1872 and later on the post was upgraded to chief commissionership from 1872 and General D. M. Stewart was appointed the first chief commissioner of the penal settlement. The year 1942 saw Ross nosedive with bombardment, shelling and ultimate destruction. Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose visited Port Blair on the 29th of December 1943 and was ceremoniously received by Admiral Ishikawa, the overlord of the islands, and then was escorted to Ross Island. Several consultations took place during the day. Here, Netaji hosted a dinner party to the members of the Indian Independence League, Andaman branch, and the Japanese authorities. After the surrender of the Japanese forces at the end of World War II, the islands were reoccupied by the British in October 1945, but they could not revive the old glory of Ross. Ross Island is no longer inhabited, except for the personnel who man naval installations and Cheetal, the spotted deer, which were introduced quite recently on the island. Colonial houses and buildings in a state of acute disrepair are scattered over the island. Speaking of an age when the island throbbed with life and activity. Walking around on the island amidst the most incredible overgrowth of tree roots and creepers that have made these ruins their home will surely fill one with a feeling of awe and an empty, mysterious feeling. Ross is our heritage an important page of Andaman history. Viper Island was selected as a place where the members of the chain gangs were put on the hardest labor. On 8 March 1858, Dr. Walker, the superintendent of the penal settlement, dispatched four sections of convicts to Viper Island from earlier stations of Ross Island and Chatham Island to work there as convict labor for cutting and clearing the jungle under the control and command of naval brigadesmen. The island derives its name from the vessel Viper in which Lieutenant Archibald Blair came to the islands in 1796 with the purpose of establishing a penal settlement. For speedy clearance of jungle at Viper Island more and more number of hands were needed. Hence, number four division was deployed there. Later, this island was considered to be the headquarters in that area of Western District. Captain J.C. Horton, the superintendent of the settlement, wrote in his report on the administration of Port Blair in the year 1860-61 to the government of India that the Viper Island was almost entirely cleared. The top of the hill was cut off at a depth of 16 feet. The earth from there was used to reclaim the area on the east coast. On this level ground he mentioned that a hospital was raised four feet from the ground. Another spacious building with hundred beds adjacent to it had been completed with a fine finishing of boarded floor. There was a lot of space for female ward and dispensary. 
a small bungalow intended for a kacheri had been finished and the posts for the resident apothecary's house had been raised. Three deep wells and a good road surrounded by bridges on both sides were constructed. Colonel B. Ford succeeded Captain J.C. Horton and took over the charge of the superintendent of this penal settlement in May 1864. He introduced certain disciplinary methods in the settlement to enforce and exercise strictness among the convicts. He initiated the construction of the building of Viper Jail in 1864. The construction work was completed in the year 1867. This single-storied Viper Jail building was the first ever jail to be built in these islands under the penal settlement for incarcerating the convicts. But time has put a spell on it. The remains of the jail building mutely stands here, insignificantly, in an utmost deserted condition. In the same compound, once there were four small and a big jail, surrounded by a large boundary wall which housed about 2,000 convicts. Some of the remains of the brick masonry boundary wall can be seen even today. Lord Mayo fell victim to an assassin's knife and succumbed to death instantaneously on the 8th of February 1872 at 7 p.m. at the Hope Town Jetty. The convict Sher Ali, who killed Lord Mayo, was condemned to death and hanged in the Viper Gallows on Monday, the 11th of March, 1872. It was these incidents in the period in the penal settlement that resulted in many more stern changes towards the penal settlers. The Maharaja of Jagannath Puri, Gajpati Bir Kishore Singhdev, was brought here on transportation condemning him for a term of life imprisonment in 1879 concerning his involvement in helping the rebels in the First War of Independence, 1857. He was assigned wheat grinding and extracting oil from copra. Consequently, he succumbed to death within months in 1879. The gallow was built on a hillock adjacent to the guards room. There were cells for the condemned ones on either side. The plan was drafted exquisitely with masterminds. The platform was built on a level ground through which the prisoner could move with ease and comfort. By the year 1864, there was no jail. The convicts were housed in iron chains in different barracks at different locations in the settlement. In 1868, the practice of binding several convicts in the night with iron chains running through their legs attached to an iron ring known as chain gang was started. The prisoners who had been sentenced to chain gang were put to hard labor during the daytime. In order that the severe punishment inflicted there on the convicts might have a deterrent effect on the others, all the convicts on their arrival at the Andamans were kept in the Viper Island for a month to witness the different forms of punishment. Mr. Campbell visited Viper Island in 1872 and suggested the opening of a refractory ward there. The local offenders among convicts were put under hard labor with or without meager food. He extended the time for lodging the newly arrived convicts in Viper Island to one year. As soon as the cellular jail and the associated jail were constructed, all the prisoners on their arrival at Port Blair were to be lodged in the cellular jail and its associated jails for six months and 18 months respectively. Thereafter, the procedure of sending newly arrived convicts to the Viper Island jail was discontinued. The work assigned to the convicts were of sufficient severity to act as a punishment and the tools were made so that they could not be used by those handling them to attack jailers or fellow prisoners. Among the tasks set was coir pounding in which a certain quantity was to be produced and made into bundles every day. 
The heavy mallets used were fastened for safety by a short lanyard to the beam on which the husk was broken up. Besides the wards, there were a number of cells for solitary confinement. Some of these were occupied by prisoners. To maintain discipline and for the protection of the settlement, a military force of about 400 men was stationed at Aberdeen, Ross and Viper, which comprised of the two companies of Europe, four of native troops and a battalion of military police. After cellular jail was constructed at Port Blair, the prisoners were lodged there instead of Viper jail and the latter one was discarded on various recommendations. Hence, all the buildings at Viper Island were vacated and the building materials were disposed of by way of sale to the public and other organizations. During World War II, the Japanese had occupied these islands since March 23, 1942. They had also established their station at Viper Island. The building materials there were obtained after demolishing several vacant buildings by the Japanese forces for making bunkers, pillboxes, etc. Thereafter, the abandoned old building materials were disposed of, raised to ground level, barring a few small ones for jails, gallows, etc. Discipline station for the chain gang convicts in Viper Island. The entire island was considered as jail complex under the Britishers. Deserted portions of the infamous Viper Gallows, surrounded by trees of forgotten historical importance, stand as a mute witness of the past to tell posterity of the human sufferings and torture where many of the freedom fighters were once executed. Out of a total of 139 years of present history, Viper Island has played a significant and prominent dreadful role in the early 87 years of dominant and horrifying records. Jaravas also belong to the Negrito stock, who live in the west coast of South and Middle Andaman Islands and roam about the reserve forest having an area of about 765 square meters. Once hostile and unfriendly with outsiders, the Jaravas have now started responding to administrative overtures.
is the oldest man in the community. He and his wife, Boa, made axes and other tools for the community. They generally speak the Jeru dialect. However, even now in the new situation today, they still follow their own and weeping by elders and later dancing and singing the whole night. Most of these rites and rituals are performed at night. As there is no one left with a proper knowledge of their own life cycle rituals, they have no option but to reduce them to a minimum. The great Andamanes have learned to grow in a small way sweet potato, tapioca, on their traditional mode of subsistence, that is, hunting and gathering. Earlier, they had the custom of deserting the hut where the person died and burying the dead body next to Economy adopted several new food items. At the level of socio-cultural rituals, they have resisted such infiltration and adoption.
the women have traditionally used the indigenous nakuyage, a tassel made of tender palm leaves to cover their private parts. Loincloths are commonly used by most men and grown-up boys. Both men and women adorn themselves with paint. Traditionally, painting is exclusively the job of women. It is done either with red ochre or white clay, commonly called alam by the ongi. An ongi woman, immediately after her marriage, is often expected to paint her husband's body and face with white clay. It is believed that the more a wife loves her husband, the more care she takes during painting. with cane baskets and wooden buckets may be found hanging from the poles and roof of the communal hut. The period of mourning continues for at least four to five months or till such time when they are sure that the flesh has completely decayed and the bones will not smell.
Yes. An interesting feature of Nicobar society is that after marriage, the groom shifts to the father-in-law's house to help if other male members are not there. In many cases, the girl... women earlier but it seems to have totally disappeared now. At present the Nicobarese men by and large put on brightly colored shorts and use ready-made shirts Nicobarese Christians are members of the Protestant Order of the Church of India. However, it is only on Sundays and other Christian festival days that the Nicobarese regularly attend church services. Thus it is not untrue to say that the islanders are Christians on Sundays and Nicobarese on other days.
In the forest of Great Nicobar, the southernmost and the largest island in the Nicobars, lives a distinct tribe called the Shompen. They hunt, fish and collect forest produce. Their huts are built on poles. They use long spears with mildly poisoned tips for hunting and fishing. They also have small gardens of pandanus and rear domestic pigs. Their population is reported to be only 250. The Shompen are semi-nomadic people who move from place to place as and when required. Their movements are regulated by the availability or otherwise of fruits and game. The Shompen prefer to build their houses either on the slopes or at the bottom of a valley, not too far away from sources of drinking water. Though they do not drink stream water, they prefer to have a stream near the settlement to use for bathing and other purposes, including gardening. They manufacture javelins or darts, which are used only to chase with. The dart is made of a single piece of heavy wood. The dao, their most common implement, is obtained from the coastal Nicobaris or from laborers working in the area and is also provided by the administration. The Shompen produce fire by friction of wood. The dry wood of the inbot plant is split into two. One of the strips is chiseled into a cylindrical rod with a rounded butt and the other is flattened with a small groove on it. The butt of the first piece is churned in the groove of the second till the dust raised by the churning catches fire. The social organization of the Shompen is based on tradition, kinship and locality. The members of a band are related to one another through blood or marriage. The family is the most important social unit in Shompen society. A Shompen family is controlled by the head of the family. Women are not supposed to move freely outside the settlement without the permission of the head of the family or headman of the band. The Shompen do not celebrate the birth of a child. They do not make any ceremonial distinction between a male or female birth, nor do they show any preference either for a son or a daughter. Among the Shompen, monogamy is the commonest form of marriage followed by polygamy. A Shompen acquires his mate in different ways. The traditionally approved means of entering into matrimony are through capture and negotiation. The Shompen have no modern horticultural implements. Nowadays, they get spades and other implements from the local administration. Despite the fact that there is hardly any institutional change among the Shompen, a few changes in their dress, cooking utensils and food